So you ready? Let's get started. I'm ready. Okay. So hello everyone. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have uh, here, um, I mean, uh, there, uh, Professor uh, Aguro from uh, Louisiana State University. And so he's going to tell us today about quantum field theory in curved space times. And so I will be moderating the questions. So if you have some questions, you can um, ask them in the chat. And uh, Ivan said that, you know, if it's a question directly uh, addressing the, uh, the content of the lecture, then I, I will uh, ask him the question. Otherwise, if it's a bit tangential, uh, maybe we will wait uh, toward the end of the break for the, for the final round of questions. All right, um, Ivan, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Florian, for the, for the introduction. And hello, everybody. Um, uh, so um, let me move this from my screen. Uh, you don't see, you see well my slide, right? Uh, yes. Because I have, uh, okay. So, uh, it's a mouse, okay. Okay, uh, but you don't have anything in the middle because I have a bar, a bar in the No, middle. no, okay. we, are, we don't see the bar. Okay, so first, uh, thank the organizer. Uh, I think this is uh, really amazing having you know almost hundred people attending this this uh, this this school uh, from all over the world. Um, I imagine organizing this is, is a significant effort, uh, uh, but this is this is very important for everybody. So so thank you. Um, also, thank you for all uh, the audience attending it uh, because you know uh, this cannot be made without you. Uh, so um, uh, the question, first question is why why a course like this? Why I want to speak about quantum field theory in core space times in a quantum gravity scope? Uh, the question uh, uh, is important because this is an old subject. Uh, uh, it's not something new, um, uh, but but I think it's important to to discuss it because first of all, it is not easy to learn uh, because there are not too many. Uh, uh, complete references at the at the appropriate level. There are good books, but but in my opinion, they are either very mathematical or too little. Uh, so it's not it's not easy to to learn uh, uh, the subject, um, in particular to go from the formality to practical applications. Uh, and also, I think it's important because you know uh, uh, this is the the uh, the basis of many topics in quantum gravity. So learning this well uh, uh, will, will help you a lot uh, in, in, in a study, uh, many other topics. So my goal here is to you know, uh, introduce the basic formalism, uh, in particular the mathematical ingredients, and to discuss some of the physical consequences as much as time permits. Um, and uh, I want to provide the background for other courses, uh, like you know Alejandro Perez course on black holes and and, and Merce Martin Benito on quantum gravity. So 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 that will be also useful on that respect. But the point is that you know this is just uh, four uh, lectures or fifty minutes, and quantum field theory in core space times, uh, you know, can fill uh, many books. So what I can do in in these four lectures is just to give you a flavor of what it is. It is not possible for me to go into details. And so take this uh, more like, like an advertisement or an invitation for you to go and study it. So I'm aware I'm gonna, you know, uh, I mean, there are two ways I could teach this. Just focus on few, very few topics and give them in detail <laughs> uh, or give you a fast but more global overview. I took the first option a couple of years ago, and I'm going to take the second option. Uh, this, so uh, I will go fast, uh, and it's, it's some information goes over your head. Uh, um, it's not surprising, <laughs> uh, so 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 that that is possible. But you know, reading again my slides that will be available for you uh, uh, will give you you know more time to digest it. And again, this is an invitation for you. You know, to get a global viewpoint of what are the important concepts. Okay, so um, um, the program I want to follow is, is this one, uh, four parts, a quick introduction, 
Then uh, a section on quantum mechanics of bosonic linear systems, then uh, quantum field theory in court space times and, and applications. How much I will cover that will depend on, on, on time. Uh, 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 so I will, I will keep moving and whenever I have to stop, I will. Uh, my slides will be available anyway. Um, so introduction. So I mean, let me just give you a short retrospective on our description of physical reality. And I like to think in this in these uh, global terms. You know, initially, since uh, physics is uh, organized science, uh, starting with Galileo, Newton, etc., we have divided physical reality in two entities: uh, particles describing matter, they have well-defined position, velocities, momentum, etc., and fields describing the interactions or forces between them. Then quantum mechanics appears and we are able to quantize matter and provide them with some wave-like attributes. But still we are describing particles. You know, particles are indestructible. You know, there is probability one always of finding uh, a particle somewhere. And they are objective. You know, any observer will agree that a particle is somewhere. So we are still describing, you know, the same uh, uh, the same uh, entity. But then, as you know, special relativity uh, comes in, and in order to make quantum mechanics compatible, uh, you know, we notice that that we cannot have particles anymore. So, in some sense, special relativity spoils this this happy situation. It spoils with quotations because you know it brings many other benefits, uh, uh, fantastic benefits. And, and, and we have to describe everything using fields. So this, this separation is no anymore in place. And we have this huge unification that all entities in nature are, are described by quantum fields. And that is quite amazing uh, conceptually. That it contrasts with our perception of particles around us. Uh, but there is a nice mathematical and physical surprise. Uh, if you imp impose a strongly uh, 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 special relativity principles, Poincaré invariant, so you ask your action to be Poincaré invariant, S matrix, etc., then you find that Hilbert spaces uh, host irreducible representations of the Poincaré group. And, and this means that there is a basis of states uh, quantum states that have uh, attributes like energy, momentum, spin, mass, and all the attributes of particles. So in this quite unexpected manner, uh, uh, the particle interpretation emerges from a, from a field theory. So still we are describing fields, but there are some states which, which uh, describe, you know, which, which reconcile <laughs> Uh, the theory with our perception of, of particles as such. And you may wonder why I'm explaining you uh, all this. Uh, and it's because, you know, if you now put GR, general relativity, in, and if you know about GR, you notice that the Poincare group is a special feature of flat spacetime. That group is only a symmetry of Minkowski spacetime. It is not a symmetry of, of a global symmetry of, of Schwarzschild, of Kerr, of Freeman Robertson Walker. So we don't have any more these uh, irreducible representations of the Poincare group in our Hilbert spaces. And therefore, it is not clear at all whether there are states with particle attributes in the same sense, sense as they are in flat space time. The question is therefore, can we still have a particle interpretation of QST out of the idealized Minkowski spacetime. Idealized because if there is mass, Minkowski spacetime is, is gone. And the answer happens to be no. And this is one of the main goals, you know, of the main messages I want to communicate. No, there is no an, an ambiguous and universal particle interpretation of a field theory, except in very special circumstances, like flat spacetime or we, when we have a lot of symmetries. The message that you need to take with you is that accept that quantum field theory is a theory of fields. And as such, it makes perfect sense. Particle interpretation is extremely useful, uh, but it's only available 
in special circumstances. Whenever you know, we have a lot of symmetries or whenever we focus on distances much smaller than the curvature scale. There, there is a particle interpretation, but in general, there is no. So in general, uh, the notion of particle, even the notion of vacuum is ambiguous. Uh, and this is the main message I want to communicate uh, at the end of this lecture. So, you know, to formulate quantum field theory in court space times, we need, so to speak, to unlearn the way we think about quantum field theory. Because whenever we learn a standard quantum field theory, we not only interpret the theory using particles, but, you know, eventually we even think about the theory as a theory of particles. In fact, you know, the biggest experts in quantum field theory call themselves particle physicists. <laughs> so what we have to do is to unlearn <laughs> or, or, you know, remove this particle uh, interpretation as being the primary uh, uh, part of the theory and, and, and recognize what is really uh, essential and universal and extend that to, to court space times. And I like to use the analogy of a special relativity and GR. The first time you learn special relativity, the theory is presented as a relation between space-time and, and time-like intervals, you know, space-like and time-like intervals measured by inertial observers, you know, Lorentz transformations, etc. But 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 whenever you want to extend the theory to, 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 to gravitational situations, you realize that this. Uh, inertial observers are not the essential part of the theory. Uh, this coordinate transformations is not essential, but rather you focus on what is the key mathematical structure, the Minkowski metric. This is, this is what is universal uh, in a special relativity. And once you have it, you generalize. We are going to do the same here. I'm going to try to find what is the essential mathematical structure of quantum field theory uh, in order to be able to generalize it in a straightforward uh, manner. So things I will discuss, I will discuss the mathematical formulation of quantum fields propagating on, on globally hyperbolic space times with a fixed metric. So the metric will be fixed once for all and will be classical. So gravity is just an spectator and fields propagate on the top of them on the top of this metric. I will restrict to linear fields because I don't have time to cover uh, more things, but that is not a problem because most of the most important results like Hawking radiation, particle creation, etc., appear already at the linear level. I will not cover interactions, back reaction, renormalization, anomalies, and many topics that I have worked on and I would love <laughs> to, to discuss, but I don't have time. References, you know, there is a family of books. Um, um, uh, in my opinion, uh, as I said before, they are in two corners. Uh, um, uh, either they are uh, too formal, uh, like Wall's book, which is, 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 a, is a beautiful book. It's a piece of art uh, from my viewpoint, but it may be too formal for many, many students. Uh, or Parker's book, which is on the other corner, which is uh, uh, more addressed to particle application, uh, particular applications and, and, and less clear in the formal aspects. Birrell and Davis is very good, but it's very old. So, so I will try to interpolate between, between them. Okay, so uh, the first part of this course, quantum mechanics of bosonic linear systems. And with quantum mechanics, I mean systems with finitely many degrees of freedom. So this is like a bunch of oscillators, if you want, possibly time dependent. The first question you can ask me is, you know, why, why I came to a quantum gravity school to discuss the harmonic oscillator? What are we doing here? Uh, I will refer you to the great uh, Sidney Coleman uh, with his famous sentence, which uh, in my opinion cannot be uh, more true. Uh, and the reason is that many of the mathematical and conceptual aspects of quantum field theory in court space times, they have a simpler analog with a quantum mechanical system. 
Of course, quantum fields add additional problems because of the infinitely many degrees of freedom. But, but we should separate <laughs> uh, uh, the two problems, the ones that are due to the field uh, theory character from the ones that are not. And, and I would say the ones that are not at 80% of the problems and the field theory are 20%. So I think it's much better to understand uh, this 80% in a simplest context because, because that removes the complications of, of, of infinitely many degrees of freedom. So if you are able to, uh, so uh, this is for me the, the most important part of this, of this course, this section. And if you understand it well, uh, I, I'll, be, I'll be more, more than happy. Uh, and also my advice is, you know, whenever you tr train yourself, go to a single harmonic oscillator or two of them or a bunch of them, because again, many of the structures are present already there. Good reference for this uh, chapter. Uh, there is a, a very nice uh, review article, I mean, semi-review article, uh, recent, uh, written by uh, Lucas and Eugenio. Eugenio is here in the audience. That is wonderful because he can answer questions. Uh, hi, Eugenio. Uh, 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 and then um, um, original references is this paper by Ashtekar and Magnon, and, and Walt's book is also a good, a good reference. I will, I will not follow exactly any of them. I will do it my way, but, 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 but all this is very nicely explained in these references. Okay, this section, classical theory, quantum theory, color, vector spaces, and then something short about Gaussian states. Classical theory. So first of all, tell me what I mean by a linear system. A linear system is made of two ingredients. One, the phase space needs to be a vector space, cannot be a manifold, has to be a vector space. And this is important because in a vector space, we have global coordinates. So we don't need to, to worry about different, different charges. So this is a mathematical uh, uh, condition. Physical, physically, what we mean by a linear system is a linear, a system whose Hamiltonian is at most quadratic in the coordinates and momentum. And it's called linear, even though Hamiltonian is quadratic, because if the Hamiltonian is quadratic, the equations of motion are linear, because you know, remember uh, Hamilton's equations, you take derivatives of the Hamiltonian. So, so, so the equations of motion are linear. Uh, that, is, that is the key part of linear system. The mathematical structures of the classical theory, as many of you may know, is we have uh, the space of physical states, uh, which we call the phase space. And as I said, it's a real vector space of even dimension. N is the number of degrees of freedom of, of configuration variables. I will use uh, 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 this index A. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse. The yes, cursor? yes, okay. yes, we can. Thank you. And, uh, uh, so, and Eugenio said hi. Say it again. And Eugenio said hi. <laughs> hi, Eugenio. Uh, so this index A uh, uh, is for me an abstract index, just denotes that we are dealing with, with a vector. And whenever I have components, I will use Latin indices. We have states, uh, physical states, and we also need observables, you know, the stuff that we measure in the lab. They are real functions in the phase space. In particular, the simplest observables are linear observables, and they are just elements of the dual space of the, of the, of the phase space. So they have an index downstairs, and they act on states to give you a real number. We can find a basis of them, uh, I call them elementary observables, and they are just your Q's and your P's. I is just a level of the different basis elements, the first basis element, the second, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we have two N of them. And again, A just reminds us that this is a, 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 a dual vector. And therefore, you know, in particular, if you, you know, any dual vector can be written as a linear combination of the basis elements. Uh, eta i are just the components on that basis. Uh, 
Um, let me try to, to put the bar somewhere else. Uh, um, okay, so uh, of course, any other linear observable can be built by taking, you know, sums of products of the elementary observables, you know, uh, uh, they, you know the, the identity uh, operator, linear, quadratic, etc., etc., and symmetric because we are working with bosons. Um, um, third element, we need a symplectic uh, form in the phase space. A symplectic form, uh, you know, it's a two form, it's antisymmetric and not de non degenerate, and it has an inverse that I call with the same symbol with index upstairs. Uh, one point is that uh, uh, the symplectic form is a form, so it really lives in the tangent space of the phase space. <laughs> but because the phase space is a vector space itself, uh, we can identify the phase space with its tangent space. And therefore, we can define the action of the symplectic form already on, on vectors in the phase space itself. Uh, uh, so we call it the symplectic structure because it acts on elements of the phase space itself. This is, again, possible because of linearity. The components of the symplectic form, as you know, in a, in a canonical basis uh, uh, is made by block diagonal matrices in which in each uh, elements of the diagonal in which each element of the diagonal is a is a two by two matrix of this form and the inverse uh, has that form i go fast because you know all that uh, well uh, um, um, the important thing to notice is that the symplectic form is the defining mathematical structure of classical mechanics and it has two important roles one role is that it provides an isomorphism between the phase space and its dual. Given a vector, I can obtain a linear observable just by lowering the index with the symplectic form. And more importantly, it introduces an additional algebraic structure on the set of observables, which are Poisson brackets. If you give me two any observable, O1, O2, real functions in phase space, uh, 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 you know, the, the inverse of the symplectic form give you a third observable given by this equation. If you work in coordinates, these uh, covariant derivatives just are just the, the derivatives with respect to x and p. This i, by the way, is a typo that should be a j. And as you know, all the properties of the Poisson brackets are coming from the properties of the symplectic structure. For elementary observables, X and P's, uh, uh, the Poisson brackets can be written in this compact manner. You know, they are one or zero or minus one, depending which P and which Q you choose, and that can be encoded by, by, by this equation. And for arbitrary linear observables, uh, uh, you just take the symplectic product if you want, uh, 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 and, in, and in coordinates is just the contraction of the coordinates with the symplectic form. Uh, so this is the algebraic structure that we have, uh, the Poisson algebraic structure in the space of observables. And again, this is the main mathematical property uh, of classical mechanics. Dynamics is generated by the Hamiltonian, which is a special function and is a quadratic observable for linear theories. Uh, 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 normally, you know, the constant term C can be, you know, doesn't generate dynamics because it Poisson commutes with any other quantity. So it's irrelevant for dynamics. And the linear part can be eliminated by changing coordinates. So normally I will focus on the, on the quadratic part. Evolution of observables is given by uh, uh, Hamilton's equations. And for elementary observables, uh, evolution is a linear transformation. So for elementary observables, the evolution, uh, you know, this is uh, the, uh, the elementary observable at time t is related with uh, the quantity at time zero by a matrix that depends on time, but it's just a matrix. It's a linear transformation. And, you know, you can check that, for instance, if the Hamiltonian is time independent, this matrix can be built by taking the exponential of this 
product, you know, the inverse of the symplectic form times the components of the Hamiltonian. So if the Hamiltonian is time independent, then we need time order exponential. But if not, this is simply, simply it. Uh, so you give me a Hamiltonian, I exponentiate it in this way, and then I have dynamics fully solved. Um, this is an example. Uh, I will. Uh, I have examples in my slides for you to read, uh, but 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 I will not go over them in the lecture, over all of them in the lecture because 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 they 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 we don't have enough enough time. But I thought having them in the slides will be good for you. Last ingredient: there is a distinguished group of linear transformations in the phase space. You know, every time you have a mathematical structure, there is the group of isometry, you know, uh, isomorphism, you know, where, you know, map preserving, you know, a structure preserving maps, the, the maps that preserve the main structure. In classical mechanics, they are the maps, uh, M, linear maps that preserve the symplectic structure, which is the main quantity, as I said. Uh, so this is with indices. This is in matrix notation. And they form what is called the symplectic group. So the symplectic group is the group of isometries of your mathematical construction. Uh, is, 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 if you want the space, the, the group of linear canonical transformations. And in particular, time evolution is always a symplectic transformation. So just keep that, keep that in mind. Very good. So this was just a summary to, to put all of us in the same, in the same page. Um, uh, let me go to the quantum theory. So we want to quantize this structure, you know, phase space, observables, Poisson brackets. So what do I mean by quantization? Uh, here, what I mean is the following. Uh, sorry, uh, I want... man, sorry um, Ivan, there is a question. Um, I think it's... Um... Related. So, before you move to quantization, so uh, Deepak asked, "How do we know that the symplectic structure is the only way to construct dynamics on the phase space? Are there uh, theorems in this regard?" Um, um, I mean, I, I don't understand very well the the, um, uh, the question. Uh, so um, he's asking um, whether the the symplectic structure you use the symplectic structure to build your dynamics, and he's wondering whether that's the only way. Uh, right. really this is the way that right. This is the way that reproduces uh, um, uh, the, 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 the the classical uh, dynamics, right? Uh, so 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 remember the way physics was built. So you know we first came out with equations of motion, and then uh, 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 right. Uh, so we first have the equations of motion, and then we build you know this mathematical uh, 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 construction. Um, and, uh, uh, and 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 what happens is that Hamiltonian mechanics is 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 symplectic geometry. That's 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 the way it is. So uh, and there are, I don't think there are any alternatives. I mean, no alternative, right? That's right. the way to, to proceed. As, as, as I know, no. That, that that is that is what it is. Classical mechanics is symplectic geometry. Uh, uh, Poisson Poisson brackets and symplectic uh, is the same. Uh, they are related by the inverse, but no. Classical mechanics is symplectic geometry. Thank you. Um, um, so what I mean is we need to replace the space of states by a Hilbert space. Uh, uh, and then we want to represent uh, uh, elementary linear observables as self-adjoint operators on that Hilbert space. I will use the notation R of eta because we are speaking about a representation of the operator of this observable in that Hilbert space. So R is a linear, you know, a matrix on that Hilbert uh, space. And I focus on linear observables because from them, you know, multiplying them and having linear combinations, we can generate uh, uh, the others. And of course, we want them to satisfy the classical algebraic relations. The Poisson bracket goes to commutators and we have exactly the same as in the classical theory, sorry, except that we need to add an I. And the reason is that, remember, the commutator of any two self-adjoint operators is anti-self-adjoint. So for this equation to make sense, we need to add an i to the classical Poisson, Poisson brackets. So if I 
if, I'm, if I am able to build that Hilbert space and a representation satisfying these uh, algebraic uh, conditions, I would say I have quantized the theory. So the question is, is there any way of quantizing the theory of having a Hilbert space out of the classical uh, structures, out of what I have available in the classical theory? And you can say, oh, let me try. First of all, let me complexify the phase space just to have a complex vector space. That is, that is nothing fancy. Uh, and then I can extend the symplectic uh, structure uh, uh, by linearity. So I have a symplectic complex space. Uh, so now to build a Hilbert space, I need a product. So let me define the following product. Take two elements of the complex phase space and define the, this product in this way. You know, this, essentially the symplectic product between them with a bar, with a bar on it. And I, the bar is complex conjugate, sorry. And I complex conjugate because then this product is admission. And I call this product the symplectic product. So you say here, here we have it. So we have a product, uh, a complex vector space. We have a Hilbert space, but not so nice because, uh, so can we make a Hilbert space out of, out of uh, gamma C and the product? And the answer is no, because this product is not definite positive. It fails that action of our mission in a product. And you can see that because if you put a real quantity, a real uh, 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 gamma, the norm is zero. So that tells you that, that, that the product is not definite positive in the entire gamma C. So no, unfortunately, we cannot build a Hilbert space. There is no enough structure in the classical theory. We need to add something extra. Important message. There is no enough structure in the classical theory to build a Hilbert space. There is an elegant way of fixing this. And the elegant way is to convert gamma, the real phase space, into a color vector space. So this color is going to be color vector space. It's going to be the geometry of, of linear quantum mechanics. Let me tell you what a color vector space is. It sounds fancy, but, but, but there is nothing magic on it. Definition. A real vector space is said to be a color vector space if it is equip, equipped with three structures. One is a symplectic structure that we already have. So we don't need to, to worry about that. It's bilinear, anti-symmetric, and non-degenerate. The new things that we need, a metric. If you have a metric, I am writing it with index upstairs, but it has an inverse. A metric is just as asymmetric and positive definite bilinear. So the symplectic is anti-symmetric uh, and non-degenerate. The metric is positive and, and, and symmetric. Third ingredient, a complex structure. What is this? A complex structure is nothing but a linear map whose square is minus the identity. That's it. Any linear map, linear matrix in the phase space whose square is minus the identity. With these three structures, the phase space could be a color space. However, not all of them are independent. In fact, only two of these are independent. So this is a color space if they are related in a concrete manner. For instance, if G, the metric, can be obtained by multiplying J and gamma in this particular form. Or if J can be obtained from G and, and, and omega, sorry, I said gamma, omega by multiplying them in this particular form, or omega can be obtained from G and, and J. So only two of them are independent. And, 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 and so this is what is called a three out of two property. You know, a color vector space has these three structures, but two determine the other. Any two determine the other. And, and there is this nice plot that I have taken from the, 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 the paper of, of Eugenio and, and Luca, which you know, just summarizes that. Uh, I just leave it here. I'm not going to go over it, but it just tell us that we have the three structures, the metric, symplectic and complex, and they are related by a compatibility condition. And this is what is a color vector space. Example, simple harmonic oscillator. 
vector space is given by R squared. Symplectic is the standard symplectic. Let me add the following complex structure. You can check that this is a complex structure because it's linear and the square is, the, is minus the identity. The question is, do we have a color space? Well, in order to have it, we need to check that the multiplication of J and, and omega give me a symmetric and positive definite metric. Let me check it. I put J here. I put symplectic here. I multiply and I get the identity. That is a, a, a symmetric and positive definite metric. Therefore, we have a color uh, space. So phase space with standard symplectic. And this J is a color space. Or with this G is a color space. We have the three structures. Simple, isn't it? But now the key point, it happens that from a color vector space, I can quantize the theory as follows. Let me tell you how to build a quantum theory out of these uh, 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 structures. So first, we have to complexify the vector space, as I said, and extend um, um, uh, all the structures by linearity to the complex vector space. That is, that is uh, trivial. Second, this is important. Because j squared is minus the identity, the eigenvalues of j squared are plus and minus i. Let me call gamma plus the plus i eigenspace. Gamma minus the minus i eigenspace. So therefore, if you give me a complex structure, I can always divide the phase space into eigenspace gamma minus and gamma plus. And I can decompose any vector and ambiguously in this two eigenspace because they, 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 they don't intersect except in the zero element. And I can build projectors. These are the projectors for the two. And this is the important part. It happens that the symplectic product I defined before, even when it is not definite, positive definite, in the entire complex uh, uh, phase space, it is positive definite when I restrict to gamma plus. So, so the restriction of the symplectic product on gamma plus, the symplectic eigen, sorry, the plus i eigenspace of the complex structure is always positive definite, no matter which complex structure you choose. So for any complex structure, Gamma plus is uh, is made of of vectors with positive norm. Let me uh, let me ask you a question or two questions actually here. Uh, the, uh, one of the question is uh, is there some kind of quaternionic structure uh, behind the complex structure? Uh, the complex yeah the complex structure. Um, not too sure. Uh, not as far as I can I can I can remember. Uh, uh, and if there is, I am not aware of. Uh, yeah, and then um, yeah, then the question is: Is the choice of the um, of the Hill structure is it um, uh, uh, unique or not? Good, very good. That's a very important question. I will address uh, uh, in a minute. Okay, that's, and that, so, that's the key question. That's right. And so then, uh, as a follow up, then uh, what happens if it's not unique? Then what happens? Correct. And for um, the question, uh, I will address it in detail. Very good. And then Christophe is also asking whether the value of the symplectic product depends on the choice of the real structure again. So I think that's okay. kind of uh, right because right uh, the, if you choose a different J, a different complex structure, you have a different gamma plus, and 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 the product always has the same form, but the vector space is different. Uh, yeah. But the form, the form of the symplectic product is, is always this form minus i omega, and the first conjugated, the second without conjugate. And the statement is that no matter which complex structure you choose, gamma plus is always, a, uh, the product is always positive definite within gamma plus. I have the proof here. I'm not going to go over it, but you can read it um, 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 after that. Now, great. We have a vector space, gamma plus, not gamma, gamma plus, and a product which is a Hermitian positive definite product on it. 
Therefore, we can build a Hilbert space. The Hilbert space, uh, uh, this uh, forms is called the one quanta Hilbert space. And now from, from this uh, one quanta Hilbert space, we can construct a Fock space in the standard manner. If you don't remember how to build a, a Fock space out of a Hilbert space is this. You take the Hilbert space to the zero power. This is just the complex numbers. Direct sum, the h, direct sum h squared, symmetrized because everything has to be symmetric because we are describing bosons, plus h cubed symmetrized, plus h to the fourth, et cetera, et cetera. That is a Fock space. States in the Fock space looks like as follows. They are made of elements of h0, which are complex numbers, elements of h, which are just uh, 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 elements of gamma plus, and then symmetric tensors with two indices uh, built in gamma plus, uh, tensors with three indices in gamma plus, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this is the form of, 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 of these uh, elements of, of the focus space. And they are just built from the classical phase space. This is why this is, this is, this is, this is nice. So we have a focus space. And this is the Hilbert space of our quantum theory. Next, let me define annihilation and creation operators. The statement is the following. If you give me any vector in the real phase space, I can construct out of it creation and annihilation operators. They are going to bring the level of the, of the vector I start with. Of course, they also depend on the complex structure that, that I choose at the beginning, uh, but I don't, I don't keep the J just to, to aminorate the notation. So the action of the creation annihilation operator on an element of the focus space is the following. Uh, 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 so let me go back and I will show you best. Uh, uh, um. So uh, remember, this is, this is the form of a general uh, vector in the focus space. So the annihilation kills Z. Z is the part if you want coming from the vacuum. Gamma is one quanta state. Eta is two quanta state. Uh, chi, three quanta state. So annihilation operator kills the part coming from the vacuum. Gamma bring it to the vacuum. How? Multiplying with, with, with zeta, with, uh, 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 you know, by, by taking the Symplectic product of zeta and, and gamma, I make it a number. The second uh, brings to the first one by taking product with zeta. So uh, now let me show you. You know, the vacuum entry now is the product of your zeta and your gamma. The one quanta entry now has one index because one index of eta ha has been contracted with, with, with zeta plus uh, and so on and so forth. Similarly, one defines creation operators. A creation operator, you know, just takes a state, uh, the vacuum entry, you get zero. Uh, the one quanta entry is the previous vacuum, vacuum entry times uh, the element uh, uh, zeta plus, of course, or the projection on, the, on gamma plus, the second, etc. This is the way it is. And the coefficients uh, uh, are needed uh, for the following. Uh, um, uh, also, not, notice that annihilation operators are anti-linear uh, uh, in the in zeta and creation are linear. And you can check from these definitions, which are a bit abstract. You need to look at them in detail. Uh, I, I I recommend you to do it. That annihilation operators always commute among themselves. Creation operators also, if you take the dagger of this equation, and annihilation with creation. The commutation is given by the symplectic product of the two uh, elements, uh, zero one and zero, and, and zero two. And you can check that out of these equations. I recommend you to do this exercise. Now, I can represent any linear observable in that uh, Fock space as follows. You give me any classical observable. The statement is that the representation of that linear observable in the Fock space is given by this equation. 
I times A minus A dagger, the A and A dagger associated to that element as I, as I mentioned before. So, and the statement is that this is a good representation. In particular, you can check that the commutation is given precisely by the symplectic product. Uh, 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 sorry, I should have this downstairs, downstairs, and that upstairs. It's the symplectic product of this of this gamma uh, eta one and, and eta two. So the statement is that in this way we build a satisfactory representation. And um, 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 sorry, and just to finish this part, dynamics. How do I do time evolution? Very easy. You just take the same formula that I have above, but you replace eta by the time evolution of eta in the classical theory. So remember, eta is an element of the classical phase space. So you just evolve it and use the same formula. That is exactly the way the Heisenberg operator uh, evolves. Okay, so 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 so, uh, um, um, and I have here a, 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 an example with the harmonic oscillator that you can check if you if you want. Uh, uh, okay, so 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 let me summarize. So the summary is that uh, 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 classical mechanics is symplectic geometry. Linear quantum mechanics is a color color geometry. All what you have to do is to include either a metric or a complex structure in the phase space, and you are able to build a Fock space out of the Hilbert space. You know, it's a representation based on the classical phase space. <laughs> so it's a very natural representation. And I have given you a recipe to uh, a recipe to, to, to build a representation. And that is the way I like to think about quantum mechanics. But that is not the way I do calculations, and and I probably you know this formulation was unfamiliar to most of you. Uh, uh, but I uh, what I want to do to, to tell you is that please study it because it's conceptually clean and tells you what are the key structures in the in the classical theory. Now let me tell you how I apply this in practice. The way I apply this in practice is the following. I'm going to explain it in more detail, but this is just a summary. First, I choose a basis on the gamma plus, the, the subspace of, of positive norm uh, uh, selected by J. Then I build annihilation and creation operators out of these basis elements. Then I'm, I'm going to write a representation for the elementary observables, Qs and Ps out of that in a simple manner. And then I will be able to do time evolution, and then, you know, uh, multiplying it by the components of another covector, I will have the representation of any any linear observable. By the way, I will not keep carrying this notation representation defined by J of this operator because the notation is very heavy. So from now on, I will use just a smaller hat to indicate the representation. Uh, as we normally do in textbooks. Okay, let me do it. First, choose a basis of gamma plus. I call these vectors V. They have an index, Q some piece, but and they are labeled by by capital I. So if, if I have n n, you know, gamma plus is an n-dimensional vector space. So I have n vectors in the basis. So capitalizes the label of the vector, vector one, vector two, vector three, et cetera. I choose them normalized with the symplectic product. You know, these are orthonormal basis. I define A's and A daggers for each of them, as I told you before. And then the representation of the elementary observables, Q's and P's, is just given by this expression. There is a sum in capital I. Sum in capital I for each basis element times the annihilation plus the, the emission part, and, 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 and that's it. And you can check that, that, that this representation satisfies the commutation relations. You can also invert this relation. You, know, you can extract A's and A daggers out of the R 
uh, out of Qs and Ps just by taking the symplectic product with the basis elements. Heisenberg evolution, all what I have to do is to replace the basis elements by the time evolution. I had VI before, now I have VI of T. And this is the solution to the classical equations of motion with initial data V0. So trivial, just replace the basis, basis elements by the time evolution. And I have here the Heisenberg uh, operation. And then any other linear observable is obtained from the elementary ones by, uh, 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 by taking linear combinations. Florian? Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, the question from Sami is that, is this procedure an improved version of uh, Dirac's program of quantization? And I will then... Yeah, so is this uh, what you're describing now? Is it an improved version of uh, uh, Dirac's program of quantization? You know, I think right. so. I mean, uh, yeah. It's a, a geometric way to formulate Dirac's program. I don't like to say I am improving Dirac <laughs> or, or, or we are improving Dirac because Dirac is Dirac. So, so I would say it's, it's you know, a, a geometric way of implementing uh, Dirac's uh, program. Uh, I think it's a geometric quantization kind of, right? What you're doing. Right, it's a geometric quantization. People call it geometric quantization. And, 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 and so it's a geometric way of, 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 of implementing the Dirac program. Okay, then the vacuum is just uh, kill the state killed by all the annihilation operators. And acting with creation, I create number of states and they expand uh, the Fock space. And this is all what I need to, for doing physics. Uh, all what I have in this slide is all what I use to do physics. In the first box, I have a representation of the elementary observables based on a basis of a subspace of the, of, the back, of the phase space singled out by my complex structure. But once I have that, this is just uh, a, standard, a standard quantum mechanics. Um, so um, I am about finishing this part, and then I will, uh, we will have a break. So comments. Uh, one comment is that rather than introducing a complex structure, many times it is easier just to identify gamma plus itself, uh, just using physical arguments, as I will show you in an example in one second. So again, many times it's easier to identify what is the gamma plus you want to use. Question, can I construct the complex structure or the metric G out of it, we have done it the other way around. I told you G and I, uh, we saw how to derive gamma plus. Can, I, can we do it the other way around? And the answer is of course. And if you give me a normalized uh, orthonormal, sorry, orthonormal basis on that uh, choice that you have made, then the metric is just built by, by taking this uh, symmetrized product. Just, just that's it. And second, from J, you can from G, you can construct the complex structure uh, multiplying by the symplectic form. Uh, uh, so, so, so that's it. And these are, are important equations. So this is the relation from gamma plus to the color structures. Uh, and important, J, uh, G and J do not depend on the concrete basis you choose. Even though it seems that it, it depends, it is independent of the basis you choose within gamma plus. They only depend on gamma plus. For a simple harmonic oscillator, you have here an example. Normally, we like to choose gamma plus to be the space of initial data for positive frequency solutions. Uh, so in phase space language, the, the initial data for a positive frequency solution is just uh, this basis vector, one dimensional because we have one oscillator. And then doing this multiplication of this basis vector and, the, and its conjugate, I obtain the metric and out of the metric, the complex structure. So this, this is an example. I go fast, but you have the slides to look this in more, in more detail as I, as I promised. Okay, so the ambiguity uh, 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 I'm going to stop here and we are going to have a, a five minute uh, break 
and then I will I will uh, continue. Do you want to take a, there, there was a question, a bit of sideways. Do you want to take it now or? Um, um, or you prefer to take it sideways? Okay. We, can, okay. we can have it at this. So we will convene in five minutes then at uh, okay. 32. Okay, we are back in business. So let me address now the very important question um, uh, it was asked before. You know, it's obvious that we have based the entire construction of this quantum theory, including the notion of vacuum and number states. We have rested on a choice of color structures, either a metric G or a complex structure. Uh, 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 so, so there is ambiguity. The question is, is there a preferred choice? And if not, what happens? So um, is there a preferred choice? Yes. Yes, if we have symmetries. As normal, as usual in physics, symmetries help a lot in making decisions. They also help here. Theorem. If the Hamiltonian is time independent, then we have a symmetry under time translations. Then there is a choice, a unique choice of J or G, complex structure or metric, that is left invariant under time translations. And that one is preferred because it respects the symmetries of our, of our system. The main symmetry, which is time translations. We are here with quantum mechanics, so, 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 so we don't have you know, all the symmetries that we have in field theory, but we have time, time invariance. And then there is a preferred mathematical choice. Uh, but you may wonder, you know, this is a bit mathematical. Why, you know, why is that preferred? You know, the second part of the theorem is that the associated fog vacuum is the ground state of the Hamiltonian. And then everybody's happy. And then this is beautiful. I put a red box, uh, you know, mathematics and physics come together. Uniqueness coming from symmetries agrees with the fact that there is a preferred notion of vacuum given by the ground state of the Hamiltonian. Um, so happy situation. The proof is here. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go over it, but 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 it's simple because you know, in time independent situations, you can always go to normal modes, and normal modes the evolution is a orthogonal transformation. Time evolution is always an orthogonal matrix, and orthogonal transformations pick up a preferred metric, which is the Euclidean metric. So G is the Euclidean metric which is invariant under time evolution. So this is the essence of the proof, but, but I leave it here in case you want to see. But hey, here we have it. What about if we don't have time translational symmetry? If the Hamiltonian is time dependent? And here I am preparing you for quantum fields in a curved background in which the metric may change in time. So uh, there is no preferred choice. There is no a uh, choice in which everybody would agree. That is, that is the mathematical statement. And the physical statement is that in time dependent situations, we don't have a ground state. Energy is not conserved because the Hamiltonian is changing in time. So there is no preferred ground state and, 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 and therefore we have ambiguity. Therefore, Florian can choose something and I can choose something else. So imagine we both find a quantum representation. We choose a J and a G. One of them determines the other. From them, a decomposition, you know, a gamma plus and gamma minus. For them, a basis of gamma plus. From them, uh, one quanta, Hilbert space, Fock space, creation, annihilation, vacuum. And then we ask, OK, is there any relation? Are we describing the same? theory uh, or not? Is the two theories are physically inequivalent or they are just you know, two different reference frames to describe the same theory? Uh, better is the second case, otherwise we are in trouble. So the relation between the two representations can be obtained uh, mathematically, if you want, from the relation between the basis vectors. That is the, 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 the fastest way to relate both. So my uh, basis, uh, V, and the conjugates 
they form a complete basis of the complex phase space. Uh, v from gamma plus and the conjugate of gamma minus. But Florian's uh, 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 basis, they are elements of the complex phase space. So I can write them in my basis always. So there must exist coefficients. I call them gamma ij and beta ij, such that this equation is true. These are just numbers, complex numbers. In matrix form, Florian basis, you know, these and these conjugates are just related to my basis by a matrix, which is the change of basis. And this change of basis is made of these sub matrices uh, made of alphas and betas. And alpha is a n by n matrix, uh, beta the same, n by n. N is the number of configuration variables, and B is therefore 2n by 2n. And uh, of course, the basis, the change of basis must preserve orthogonality because Florian basis is orthogonal, orthonormal, and my basis is also orthonormal. So better the change of basis preserves the orthogonality. But that condition is just a condition about the symplectic character of B. B Believe me, that orthogonality is equivalent to say that the change of basis preserves the symplectic structure, the inverse in, in, in this case. And if you write this equation in components, you obtain some conditions on alphas and betas. And these conditions using indices, for instance, are given by this. So this is just the condition that the change of matrix is symplectic and therefore preserves uh, uh, inner products. So, 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 if you do a change of basis, make sure that these conditions are satisfied. Otherwise, you will be incorrect. Okay, from this relation between bases, it happens that one can easily write a relation between, you know, Florian's annihilation and creation operators and mines. They are given by the same coefficients, just with some conjugates and mines. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, so this box is important because tell us how creation and annihilation variables for these two different choices uh, relate to each other. Apocalypse of transformation is called. In matrix notation, this matrix is just B minus one transpose, if, if that is easier to remember for you. And from here, I don't prove it, but you need to believe me. One vacuum relates to the other as follows, because you know my vacuum is I call vacuum one, but Florian can ask how that state looks like in my Hilbert space. If I express Ivan's vacuum in my in my Fock space, how it looks like? This is given by the right hand side. N is a normalization constant. Lambda is the ratio between beta coefficients and alpha coefficients, and the state looks like the exponential of a dagger, a dagger. So if you expand this exponential, you will have you know, identity plus a dagger, a dagger, plus a dagger, a dagger, a dagger, a dagger, plus you know, powers of a dagger square. So my state looks something quite complicated when expressed in, in Florian's uh, 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 focus space. It looks like the exponential of two quanta state. You know, vacuum, two quanta, four quanta, six quanta, et cetera, et cetera. Similarly, you know, a similar question is, you know, the number, the specification value of the number of quanta in the mode I that Florian's, uh, Florian measures in my vacuum is given by beta square uh, by this expression. So conclusion, if the beta coefficients relating my basis and Florian's basis are different from zero, my vacuum and Florian's vacuum are different quantum states. And notice that beta coefficients different from zero is equivalent to say that my gamma plus and Florian's gamma plus are different subspaces, or that my complex structure and Florian's complex structure are different complex structures. So if that happens, the two vacua are different states. Therefore, different complex structures provide 
different fog representations. Although here, all of them are unitarily equivalent. Uh, this is a consequence of Stone von Neumann's theorem. So, so they are equally good. And therefore, we find that unless there is a time-like symmetry, the notion of fog vacua doesn't have any preferred meaning. There is no ground state. So we, we have to separate ground state from fog, fog vacua. We call it vacuum because it doesn't have quanta in a given basis, but it's not the ground state of the Hamiltonian. There is no ground state in time dependent situations. So, so what you mean by vacuum is a choice. And all of them are equally good unless you have a physical reason to choose one. So this relation between vacuum and ground state, you should forget it about. That is only true whenever you have time-like symmetries. Otherwise, a fog vacuum is just a mathematical entity. <clears throat> and here I show you how to compute Bogolubov coefficients. Uh, I will jam this for reasons of, of time, but 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 Bogolubov coefficients can be obtained just projecting one basis in the other, just taking the inner product of one basis element with respect to the other. Okay, to finish this this uh, 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 class, this um, quantum mechanical section, and go to quantum field theory. Let me make a very brief summary reminder about Gaussian states. I recommend you to read this book, uh, Serafini's book. It's, it's, it's very nice. Uh, uh, and quant Gaussian states are going to play a major role uh, in the rest of these of these lectures. Oops, this should appear in boxes. Okay. So definition: a Gaussian density matrix. You know, a density matrix is called Gaussian if there are many ways of defining Gaussian states. I choose the one. I choose one. <laughs> You can always start from one and derive the others. And I start from this one. If its quantum moments satisfy the same relations as a Gaussian probability distribution. And what that this means the following. The first and second moments, the moments are just expectation values. The first moments are the expectation values of Qs and Ps. Second moments, Q and you know. QQ, PP, or, or PP, you know, all the combinations. These two are the only independent moments in a Gaussian state. The rest can be derived out of them. <clears throat> How? The nth moment is zero if n is odd, except for n equal one that we have the mean. And odd moments, they can be obtained as products of second moments. Uh, you, here, you have the definition here. Let me give you an example. If I ask you what is this fourth order moment, this is given by the product of, of couples, Q1, P1, Q3, P2, all couples. There are three couples you can make out of this, and you need to keep the original order. And this is an equality for all Gaussian states. So in quantum mechanics, any Gaussian state, you know, the second moment defines all the higher order moments. So they are very simple, right? Um, and so the simplicity of Gaussian states is that we only need these numbers, you know, uh, a bunch of numbers for the mean and a bunch of numbers for the variance. And up, out of them, we have every single property of the quantum field. In fact, we can forget about the density matrix, which is infinite dimensional and capture all the properties in the mean and, and, and the second moments. This is what is so nice about, about, about Gaussian states. They are, they are very simple. Uh, one uh, uh, technical point is that, you know, rather than the second moment, it's better to work with the covariance matrix. And the reason is that the second moment has redundant information for two reasons. The second moment knows about the mean also. So it is better to subtract the mean out of the second moment, so they are independent. And second, the anti-symmetric part of the second moment is in fact the same for all Gaussian states because the anti-symmetric part 
is determined by the commutation relations. So it's just given by the symplectic form. So the only non-trivial information in the second moments is in the symmetric part, you know, in the, there is a comma missing. Uh, 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 sorry, sorry. Uh, forget about the second part, there is a typo here. It's the symmetric part, you know, just, just compute. The second moment symmetrize and subtract the index, the, the mean. Again, because the anti-symmetric part is the same for all quantum states and is, is a state independent. So therefore, when we speak about quantum states, uh, Gaussian states, we focus on the mean and the variance. The variance happens to be symmetric and positive definite. One can prove that. And there is a beautiful theory for extracting all the properties of a Gaussian state, looking at the symplectic eigenvalues of sigma. And there is a definition for symplectic eigenvalues. I don't have time to go over it, but you know, uh, I recommend you to read it because it's quite interesting. For instance, a Gaussian state is pure if the symplectic eigenvalues are equal to one. A Gaussian state is mixed if they are larger than one. From the symplectic eigenvalues, I can compute the entropy. I can compute entanglement between different sub subsystems. You know, I can compute everything just looking at the symplectic eigenvalues of the, of the covariance matrix. Uh, um, um, it's a beautiful theory, and I recommend you to read about it if you don't know. Uh, definition, quasi-free Gaussian state. I will call a quasi-free state a Gaussian state with zero mean. So only the variance. Theorem, all fog vacua are quasi-free states. Very important. Any fog vacua that you can construct, as I said before, is a quasi-free state. So it's a Gaussian state with zero mean. Second, and very important, super important, the metric that defines the fog representation that uh, we introduced before, agrees with the covariance matrix of the Fock vacuum. So the Fock vacuum has a covariance matrix which agrees exactly with, with, the, with the metric that you use to build the color space that we started from. And I love this relation because you know, this is a relation between uh, Fock quantizations and, and Gaussian states. And it provides physical words, physical uh, arguments to my previous uh, construction. I can summarize as follows. If you want to build a, physically a folk representation, give me a quasi-free Gaussian state. It's fully characterized by the, by the variance, the covariance matrix. That covariance matrix is what allows me to make out of the phase space a color space and a quantum theory. So all what I need is the covariance matrix of a quasi-free Gaussian state. And I cannot emphasize enough how, you know, how beautiful and, and be, you know, simple and elegant one-to-one -one relations uh, between you know, quasi-free Gaussian states and folk representations. And, and, and the proof uh, is an exercise for you. I give you here a hint how to relate both. Uh, the relation is very simple if you find a basis. You can reach you know, both sides using a basis and you will see that both sides are exactly, exactly the same. And, and this is the expression. Uh, and this, so this expression here in terms of a basis uh, is the same for G and sigma, therefore they are equal to each other. So, and this is all what I wanted to say, you know about classical classical uh, you know quantum mechanics of, of linear systems uh, uh, and this box summarizes pretty well uh, uh, what you need to to remember let me add something there is a beautiful extension of all this to fermionic systems in fermionic systems it happens that the role of the symplectic and the metric are interchange in the following sense the classical phase space is not equipped with, with a symplectic form because we are doing fermions and in fermions, 
the Poisson brackets are symmetric. So the Poisson brackets for fermions are defined by a metric, symmetric metric. So fe fermionic phase space is gamma and G. And to quantize a fermionic system, you need to introduce either a complex structure or a symplectic structure. And in fact, the symplectic structure agrees, uh, you know, makes the fermionic phase space a uh, color space and agrees with the with the with the covariance matrix of the of the Fock vacuum, which is anti-symmetric because you are dealing with fermions. So the roles are interchanged, but everything else uh, goes together. So summary, color vector space provides a unified geometric and beautiful framework to quantize bosonic and fermionic systems, linear systems. And the relation is this triangle relation between the three structures. And this is the end of this uh, first part. I know it's long, longer than what I uh, really wanted. Um, um, but I insist, if you understand this part, you have done 80% of the, of, the, of the work. Because many of the features of quantum fields in core spaces are just extension of this to infinitely many degrees of freedom. We only need to, to worry about the mathematical subtleties introduced by the infinite degrees of freedom. But this is, a, a, this is a, an extra problem. The other part is essentially the same. So I recommend you to go over these slides uh, slowly and absorb them, do simple exercises because, because uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. What would uh, happen if you were putting interactions in a game? Would I, um, if you were putting interactions like different types of interactions, would that change a bit your structure or? If you put interactions, as long as the theory is linear, everything is exactly the same. Because, because uh, um, I didn't use, I mean, interactions are terms in the Hamiltonian, which is like Q1, Q2. So Q1, P2, these are interactions. One affects the other. But I, I didn't make any assumption about, about the form of the Hamiltonian. I only assume it is quadratic. So as long as the theory is quadratic, all this goes through. If the theory is not linear, then we normally, you know, you need to do more effort. The norm, what we do is to solve the linear theory and then perturbatively solve the nonlinear theory. But the linear theory is still the same. So this is still useful uh, uh, as the beginning of a perturbative expansion. Okay. So um, um, uh, the program for quantum field is going to be the same. Classical theory, quantum theory, Gaussian states. I think this Gaussian state is going to be just a section and in out situations. Um, I think you will see what, what I mean by that. Classical theory. Um, 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 of course, we have to deal here with fields. Uh, you know, field is extended everywhere. We have infinitely many degrees of freedom. Due to time constraints, I will restrict to real scalar fields. Uh, uh, but one can generalize to, you know, to vector fields, to fermionic fields, uh, complex fields, um, uh, just a matter of extending the, the structures. But, but space-time is assumed to be globally hyperbolic. And that means that you can take the four-dimensional space-time and foliate it in a one-parameter family of three-dimensional special Cauchy hypersurfaces. And we have a metric and global hyperbolicity is needed because otherwise the initial value formulation is not well posed. The initial conditions doesn't determine the future evolution uniquely unless you have global hyperbolicity in the geometry and, 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 and in your field equations, of course. They are hyperbolic equations. Action. We call this the Klein-Gordon action that you are familiar with. This is the same as in flat space-time, except uh, uh, there is a typo here. Should be an, an R between uh, zeta uh, or chi, uh, xi and, and phi. There should be a capital R. 
I will tell you which, uh, what these terms are. Um, 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 uh, um, uh, so uh, NABLA is the covariant derivative uh, associated to the metric, singled out by, by the metric. Uh, R, that is not in this equation. <laughs> uh, so, so should be R and phi square here. R is the Ricci scalar, is the, the Ricci curvature scalar of the space time. And this parameter is a real number, which is called the coupling to the curvature. Uh, if we put it zero, we call it minimal coupling. And if we put it one over six, we call it conformal coupling because in the massless limit, the theory could become conformal invariant. And, and I mean, we, are, we want to add this coupling to the curvature with R here, because this is the most general extension that recovers what we know in flat space-time, right? In flat space-time, Ricci is zero and we will recover the Klein Gordon, Klein Gordon action in flat space-time. Uh, so we include this term for generality. Equations of motion are taken by minimizing the action. You have the Klein Gordon equation. And if you use uh, coordinates, you can expand this box and it takes this, this form in terms of the components of the metric uh, and the derivatives associated to your reference frame. Okay, next, I want to build the phase space to, to make connection with the previous geometric quantization. First, we need to define the conjugate moment, momentum. And you need to remember that the definition of conjugate momentum requires the introduction of a three plus one foliation. You need to choose a foliation of the space time. There are many inequivalent foliations, depending how you choose it, but you need to choose one. And the momentum is associated to that foliation. How? As follows. You give me a foliation. Given a foliation, I can define the unit normal vector field to the, to, to the foliation, uh, n mu. Out of it, I can construct this this metric H by taking the four dimensional metric and doing this uh, addition. And that is H is the metric induced on the foliation. It's a special uh, a space, uh, you know, positive definite metric inducing the foliation by the four dimensional metric. It's just the pullback of the, of the metric to the um, uh, 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 restriction of the metric to the, to the foliation. With this, the momentum is obtained by taking derivative of the field along the normal to the foliation and multiplying by the square root of the spatial metric just to give it character of a density uh, as it should be. Momentum are always uh, of density weight one. Uh, so we need to multiply by, by that. It doesn't depend on the time-like coordinate you, you use. Uh, uh, only depends on the foliation. Uh, and that, that, is, that is important to, to remember. Hamiltonian, you take the Lagrangian and you do a, a, a legend transform and you have your Hamiltonian. Phase space. Phase space is made of uh, position and momentum, field and conjugate momentum. But now we need to make a choice because we need to, to declare which type of functions we allow it in the phase space mathematically, because we need to, 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 to define it mathematically. So a common choice in Minkowski space-time uh, for, for, for functions is to choose the Schwartz space uh, uh, in Minkowski and also in cosmology, and because the, the Schwartz space has nice properties under Fourier transform. It's a stable under Fourier transform. But it doesn't generalize to coarse geometries. A common choice in coarse geometries is functions of compact support. So this is a mathematical statement, but, but we need that. So I'm going to say that the phase space is made of couples of functions of compact support, you know, smooth, smooth, smooth and, and of compact support in, in, uh, uh, in the three-dimensional slices that we are choosing. And so we have here an infinite dimensional real vector space. Each vector is, has two components the first and the second, but the components themselves has an X dependence. So they are fields. Uh, 
quick uh, quick question. Um, I think the question, uh, Pierre had a question about how did you build um, the momentum? I mean, I asked why it's not coming from a Lagrangian. I mean, you, you can also take the Lagrangian and take the derivative, uh, but you need more structure because the derivative has to be with respect to phi dot. So, and then uh, phi dot is time derivative. So you need a foliation and to, and to do this operation also a time, a time coordinate. The momentum doesn't depend at the end of the day of the time component, <laughs> but, but this is why I like more this because it makes explicit that you don't need uh, a time component. And the other way is not explicit, it's implicit. Okay, notation. I'm gonna call elements of the phase space. As I said, you know, we have an index that takes two values, I, one and two, a field and momentum, but it also has X dependence. So I'm gonna, you know, put the two information together in a Greek index. So alpha is, you know, the index I and X. A dual vector has alpha downstairs and the, the action of a dual vector on a vector, you need to contract both indices, the I and also the X, but the contraction of the X is an interval. You know, I, I am lazy, so I just use this notation so I don't have to write intervals all the time. Although I will write them sometimes just to remind you uh, what it is. So you don't forget that there are intervals in between. So we have a phase space. We also have a symplectic structure. Given two elements of the phase space, the symplectic structure give you a number, which is obtained by, by as I said, contracting indices and, and, and integrating. So we have this symplectic uh, uh, structure. Uh, uh, elementary observables. Uh, I put quotations here. You will see in a second why. Elementary observables are what I was calling before Ri. Now I call it R alpha, and we have two, but they are X dependent. So we have infinitely many. Uh, uh, um. Linear observables are just uh, uh, linear combinations of the elementary observables. And linear combinations are just the smearing of the elementary observables, phi and pi, with some uh, functions. They are of compact support. So, so you are just smear the, the field and the moment. Poisson algebra, if you give me any two linear observables, the Poisson algebra is just the symplectic contraction. As we saw in the previous section. Again, I write the integral explicitly, but 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 this is a more compact. This is a more compact. Um, uh, may, okay. may, may I ask a question? Actually, uh, is I mean there are two indices, so shouldn't there be two integrations, like over x and over y? Uh, right, but um, uh, thank you. That's a good question. Uh, so yes, the symplectic form it has x x prime, uh, but it's proportional to the Dirac delta. <laughs> So when you do the, you can do one integral and you are left with a single integral. So, so you are completely right. Sorry, I jammed one, I miss one step in between. Uh, I already took care of one interval. Thank you. This algebra, this algebra of linear observables is commonly reported in a less precise manner as this canonical Poisson bracket. This equivalent to, to, to this for all, for all um, uh, linear observables. I say less precise because if you look the right-hand side of the canonical commutation relations, you don't have an observable. An observable, remember, is a, a smooth function in phase space. What you have is a distribution. Uh, 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 so, so therefore, <laughs> this is telling us that be careful because phi and pi are not really observables mathematically in the mathematical sense. The Poisson bracket is not an observable. So rather uh, they, we can construct, I mean, and this is a subtlety that is not present in the finite dimensional case. So this is, this is this specific of field theory. Phi of X and pi of X are not observables as such uh, in the mathematical way. But if you smear them with any function F, either phi or pi, you will get an observable. So observables are obtained by smearing 
phi or pi with a, a, a smooth functions. And therefore, you know, mathematically, they are observable value distributions. This is what phi of x and pi of x really are. Distributions that after smearing give you observables. Uh, uh, um. Quantum theory. Exactly the same logics as the finite dimensional case. We need to make a color vector space out of the phase space and the symplectic form. So you, we can do that either introducing a complex structure or a matrix, one determines the other. So, they, but they have to be compatible. You know, you can introduce a complex structure, which is a linear function, linear map, whose square is minus the identity. Sorry, I forgot a minus. It's minus the identity here. Very important. And satisfying that, that the metric is positive definite. And we have out of three, two out of uh, three out of two structure. Uh, from any two, you get the other. Example uh, in flat space time. Uh, uh, let me put the universe in a box just, just for, for mathematical simplicity and for a mathless field. Then the metric takes the, this form. The complex structure takes this form, and the, 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 this was the symplectic, sorry, symplectic, complex, and the metric. And, and I will tell you later on how to compute this. Um, yes, I want just to show them so you remember they are functions of x and x prime, and, 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 and they, are, they have four components because you have fill, fill, uh, momentum, momentum, fill, momentum, and momentum field. So the, the fourth components x and functions of x and x prime. As before, if you give me j, that automatically splits the complex phase space in two eigenspaces with eigenvalues plus and minus, that they are mutually not intersecting. The symplectic product, which is defined as before, is positive definite in gamma plus. Therefore, gamma plus with the symplectic product forms a one particle Hilbert space. Now we need to do the Cauchy completion because we have infinite dimensions, but that is just a mathematical detail. And out of the one particle, we call it one particle Hilbert space, not one quanta. Uh, one particle Hilbert space. Out of it, you construct the, fog, the symmetric Fock space as before. And all what we did before goes through. So we have here a preferred representation, preferred because it's based um, uh, 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 on the phase space itself. The elements are elements of the phase space, uh, but depends on a choice of, of, of complex structure. Representation of linear observables. Uh, uh, remember, this is the way I think about the theory, not the, what I use for calculations. Uh, the representation of a linear observable is given by this expression where A is the annihilation operators associated to the element eta of the phase space, and the same for dagger. And they satisfy the canonical commutation relations. So we are happy and, and we have a quantum representation. Same logic as before, I insist. So, um, 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 if you choose an ortho orthonormal basis in gamma plus, again, V, I are, I are the elements of the basis. Now we have infinitely many, uh, one, two, three, up to infinity, because but they are countable. So um, uh, we choose them to be orthonormal. And then I can define the creation and annihilation operators for each of them and they satisfy the standard algebra. This is the way I compute. Uh, and then I have a representation for the elementary observables as, as the sum of basis mode A, basis mode conjugated A dagger. And this is an operator value. This, this, is a, this is a representation of the operator value distributions. You know, this is similar to the classical theory. Phi and pi of X are not operators. Uh, as such, because these sums don't converge in any meaningful way. 
they are not observables. Uh, so, but they are distributions uh, in the sense is marrying them out, we get observables. So linear observables are obtained by smearing out the operator value distributions. And they form the entire family of linear observables in the theory. The smearing of pi and phi the way that you want. If you want field observables, put g equals 0. If you want momentum observables, put f equals 0. And if you want a linear combination, here you have it. Dynamics. Again, we just need to replace the basis vectors in the, in the expansion by the, the time evolution. So you go to the classical theory, take the basis vector is an element of the complex phase space, plug it in the equations of motion and find the solution and plug it there. Therefore, you have the Heisenberg uh, form of your uh, basic operators. Uh, in fact, if we talk about time evolution, it's even better to forget about pi. Because if you give me phi of x and t, taking derivatives, I can get pi. So, so once you have the time evolution of phi, I already have the information for, for pi. So, 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 uh, so we can do that. Uh, if we talk about Heisenberg operators, forget about pi and just have phi uh, and just take the component a small i equal one. This is what I call s, s because it's a solution of the equations of motion. So just take uh, you know, a solution of the equation of motion with uh, initial data v, uh, v, the initial v, and this is the expression for your field operator in time. And you know, I like this expression because it's manifestly covariant. Once you have a space time, you forget about defoliation, you forget about pi. And I have a fully covariant uh, expression uh, uh, out of which I can extract all linear operators in the theory and their time evolution. So, so you know, for field theory is important because you know field theory are in a space time. So, so it's nicer if we forget about. Uh, the foliation and we make it fully covariant. And this is the way of doing it. I started with the covariant, with the canonical, I evolve in time and I extract the covariant picture out of that. And now the evolution of any linear observable is just obtained by taking linear combinations of, of, of the basic observables, where pi again should be understood in the, in the covariant uh, way as the derivative of the field operator. So as I said, this is just the representation of any linear observable satisfying the canonical, you know, the, the appropriate commutation relations. Ex example, a flat space time in a box, uh, we can choose a, a gamma plus or the complex structure associated to positive frequency modes. This is what we normally do in Minkowski space time. Yes, uh, uh, single out positive frequency modes. That corresponds to choosing the following basis. This basis for V. Now the index capital I is played by K vector. I have one basis element for each Fourier mode. All of them expands gamma plus and the conjugates gamma minus and then together form a basis of any element, uh, any complex element of the phase space. And now I just compute the representation of the operator value distribution, just taking the sum of all modes, A plus conjugate modes, A dagger. Here we have it, the standard quantization that, that we study in elementary courses of quantum field theory but derived from our more geometric uh, approach. Gaussian states, just um, 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 uh, a very short summary. It's very similar to the finite dimensional case. All moments are determined from first and second moments in exactly the same way. 
The main difference is that there are infinitely many first and second moments because we have infinitely many degrees of freedom. All of them normally are uh, written in a compact manner by paying attention to the operator value distributions uh, rather than, than to the linear operators themselves. Yes, yes. Uh, so this is the first moment as a distribution. Uh, so this is not an expectation value. This is, this is, so you need to smear this with a function and you will have a first moment. And because there are infinitely many smearing functions, this contains the information about all first moments. Um, um, sorry, this, these lines are displaced. They should be, this, uh, this text should be up, up, a little bit up. The second moments, uh, the same. But remember, they are by distributions. So this is just, again, the second moments of the quantum a Gaussian state. And the, you know, the, there is a lot of confusion uh, when you read papers about this, because people treat this as a function. And as a function, this blows up whenever x and x prime uh, coincide. There is a divergence. But, but this is not a function. This is perf perfectly well defined as a by distribution. So if you smear x and x prime, this is perfectly fine. So the two, the two point function is not a function, it's a two point distribution, in fact, and has full information about the Gaussian state in addition to the first moment. And here I have written it in a fully covariant manner. So x is vector x and t. So this is four dimensional x. So these guys have full information about the Gaussian state in the entire space time. And for instance, the fourth, the fourth moment, because this is a Gaussian state, can be written as products of second moments, following the pattern I explained before. Just take all the couples in a uh, respect in the initial order. Uh, uh, and as before, it's better to talk about the covariance, the covariance matrix, which is just the symmetrized version of the two-point distribution. So we just symmetrize it and subtract the first moments. So, so this is mathematically more, more convenient. They have the same information, of course, but it's mathematically more convenient. Quasi-free states. Quasi free Gaussian states are just Gaussian states with zero mean. All the information in the second moment. All Fock Bakwa are quasi free Gaussian states for field theory. Their covariant matrix provides the positive definite matrix which defines the Fock representation. Exactly the same as in the finite dimensional case. So if you know the two point function of your quantum state, if you give me the two point function of your quantum state, I can build a Fock representation in which this quantum state is the vacuum. So one to one relation between Fock representations and quasi free Gaussian states by this beautiful relation. And here I explain that I don't have I and J anymore because I am in the covariant language. So, so I only need field field taking derivatives, I can derive the covariance of the momentum and cross correlations. So, so, so in covariance language, uh, I just need the, the symmetrized two point function for fields and, and that's it. Again, beautiful relation between physical properties of the vacuum and mathematical structures of the quantum theory. So a vacuum, Fock vacuum is equivalent to a complex structure or uh, a G, so, you know, we have again this interplay between physics and, and, and mathematics, um, which is very, very elegant and simple. So let me see how I'm doing the time. And, and so given an orthonormal basis of positive normal solutions, uh, again, a basis of gamma plus, but now I am working with solutions. Um, the, the two point, the, the covariance can be obtained just out of them. So just S, S, S of X, S bar of X prime, and then symmetrized. 
So, so there is a relation between basis, uh, uh, covariance matrices, and, and color structures. <clears throat> so for instance, in Minkowski space-time, if you give me positive frequency modes, I plug them here and do the sum, and I obtain the expression I showed you before uh, for G. Uh, uh, just plug in there the, the, the plane waves and doing, doing the sum. The sum gives you cosines and sines uh, uh, because the symmetrization, and, and that's it. Okay, so um, 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 I'm gonna, uh, um, I don't know if I should stop here or go for two or three more minutes. Um, oh, it's up to you. I, uh, I, uh, I think we, I'm, I'm actually not sure what the organizers have in mind, but I was thinking that we could go to the end of, um, the, I mean, to the half hour and then uh, take questions from there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will go for a few more minutes, and I will. I will. Um, I will. I mean, I was told to leave a few minutes at the end for questions. Uh, the boss is here, okay. so. <laughs> <laughs> so Pietro said, "Okay." So the ambiguity. He said. So, okay. uh, so Itera said that's fine. So. Uh, so yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. So I will go uh, uh, two or three more minutes, and I will stop. The ambiguity. Like here we have again, uh, similar to the finite dimensional case. In, arbit in arbitrary space times, there is no preferred choice of either uh, vacuum, complex structure, or positive definite metric. Uh, we cannot use positive frequency solutions because in arbitrary space times, the equations of motion doesn't admit positive frequency solutions. So these positive frequency plane waves are only, uh, uh, only exist in Minkowski space-time or space-times with a time-like killing vector field, with a time-like symmetry. So in general, uh, 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 the same. That, uh, also, there are many Hamiltonians because remember, a Hamiltonian is associated to a foliation. Different foliations give you different Hamiltonians. And none of them are half ground states because they are time dependent in general geometries. So you cannot use physics. You, you cannot use ground states. There are no ground states in arbitrary uh, space time. So you cannot use that to select a preferred uh, vacuum and a preferred Fock representation. The discussion is identi identical to the finite dimensional cases, only that the indices, you know, these bases uh, contain infinitely many elements that produce some subtleties, uh, but as I will discuss uh, in a minute, but, 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 but the idea that there is no preferred the fog vacuum uh, is exactly the same. So again, when you listen vacuum, don't associate it anymore to the ground state. The ground state only exists in very peculiar situations. The notion of fog vacuum is a mathematical notion and it's just a semi, you know, sorry, a quasi-free Gaussian state. So this is what a fog vacuum is. Uh, uh, um, 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 and there are infinitely many, which are different from each other. And each of them is associated to a fog representation of your quantum theory. Subtlety. Um, 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 and the subtlety is that, remember, Florian was choosing one representation Myself, I was using another one. We agree that they are different. And in fact, these Bogolyubov coefficients are derived in exactly the same manner as before. Uh, but we said we are describing the same theory because they were unitarily related. There is a unitary dictionary between my representation and Florian's representation. I can use that dictionary to, to write my states in Florian's representations back and forth. So we can talk, we can compare. That is not true anymore when you have infinitely many degrees of freedom. In field theory, two folk representations are many times unitarily inequivalent. So uh, in, 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 in general, in fact, they are equivalent if 
and only if this mathematical condition happens. Uh, I am not deriving this for you. I am just telling you uh, that this is true. So you have to believe me for this short talk. So if you take our complex structures in the, you know, they live in the classical phase space, you subtract them and you compute the Hilbert Smith norm, which is nothing but the trace of them square. They are infinite dimensional matrices. So it's not guaranteed that the trace is finite. If the trace is finite, then there is a unitary operator relating Florian's and Ivan's uh, representations, and we can compare with each other. But if not, they are unitarily inequivalent. One practical way of checking that, this is what I use in practice, is to notice that this uh, condition is equivalent to compute the Bogoliubov coefficients between our bases. You know, just go to the bases, compute alphas and betas, and check that the beta coefficients are square summable. If they are square summable, uh, then the representations are, are um, um, uh, unitarily equivalent. In physics language, this condition, remember, beta square is the number of particles, I said that before, the number of particles that my vacuum has for Florian. So physically, the two representations are inequivalent if my vacuum has infinitely many quanta in Florian's focus space. So if the number of quanta of my vacuum for Florian is infinite, then they are inequivalent. So this is just the, the, the physical words for this mathematical condition. And you can see here that the problem originates in the infinitely many degrees of freedom. Because if you have infinitely many, all these sums are finite because you have a finite number of, of summons. So, so this is something peculiar from field theory that doesn't have an analog in quantum mechanics. A Stone von Neumann theorem fails because of that, because of the infinitely many dimensions. Sums of, of infinitely many terms are not always convergent, as, as you know well. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop here because I am already, uh, uh, I will repeat this last part next day uh, um, and because I want you to absorb this. So and now you are probably overwhelmed with information. So uh, let me just summarize that the main message I have communicated is that either in quantum mechanics, um, 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 either in quantum mechanics uh, uh, um, or uh, field theory, um, uh, I can stop sharing so you see my face bigger, right? Either in quantum mechanics or field theory, uh, 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 the quantum theory can be formulated in geometric terms that they are beautifully encaptured by this color geometry in which you introduce a new structure to the classical phase space. And this new structure can be thought as a, as a symmetric uh, 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 metric or a complex structure. Uh, uh, and that singles out the, the, the Fock vacuum and the Fock representation and the Fock vacuum happens to be fully characterized by the covariance matrix uh, because it's a quasi-free Gaussian state. And this covariance matrix nicely agrees with the, with the metric of the color vector space. So, you know, this really rounds uh, uh, the formulation and mathematics embraces physics at the end. And, uh, and I, I believe it's a very, very uh, uh, nice and, and fascinating uh, set of ideas. So I am open for questions and, and otherwise I stop here. Okay. Pierre is asking that um, in the first part of the, um, of the lecture, uh, you were, the phase space was, I think in the second part actually, the, the phase space was a vector space. And so he's asking uh, if what happens if you take actually a general manifold, what's, uh, what's, what is going to fail? Right, as I said, uh, from the very beginning, all this geometric quantization is uh, attached to linear systems. Uh, uh, because, I mean, first of all, 
um, remember the first thing I did was to take the symplectic form, which is a form. So it lives in the tangent space to the phase space. And I brought it down to the phase space. So that is only possible if the phase space is isomorphic to its tangent space. So that uh, condition is only available for, for linear systems. Uh, uh, so from the very beginning, I am using crucially the fact that the phase space is linear. Otherwise, I cannot define the symplectic form in the phase space itself, you know, as acting on elements of the phase space and not, not on tangent vectors to it. So, so the, the full structure uh, breaks down and you can only do it locally if you want. Of course, you can do it locally because any manifold is locally, uh, locally flat. Uh, and it's locally uh, RN, uh, but then you have the, the difficulties of, of you know, joining different, different uh, charts uh, and, and everything gets uh, way more uh, complicated. So, so uh, this is why I insisted at the beginning that all this is, is, is um, um, uh, thought for, for linear systems. Um, the way to do nonlinear quantum mechanics is you solve first the linear theory uh, and then do perturbative, uh, do it nonlinear quantum field theory. This is the way we do it. We solve the linear theory and then we introduce uh, 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 things perturbatively. Uh, if you are wondering, you know, I mean, I wish I could do nonlinear uh, quantum field theory rigorously in this geometric language, but remember, I mean, that is the that is the field of constructive field theory, which is you know real mathematical people, not like not like me, real mathematicians doing trying to make sense of interacting field theories, and and up to the day up to today they only are able to do it for the very 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 simplest uh, 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 field theories. Interacting field theories mathematically are, are are a mess, and we only know how to solve them. Um, yeah, so maybe just to wrap up, I think, uh, so um, Pierre was commenting that uh, geometric quantization is actually defined, uh, I think, for uh, a general symplectic manifold. Uh, but anyway, in your case, you just need uh, the linear phase space, right? So right. for in the that case, theory, that's what you, that's what you already need for this case. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Melissa, you have a question, so you raise your hand. So I cannot unmute you. You have to unmute yourself, I think. And uh, please um, ask your question. Are you able to, are you, uh, where are you? Now I am yeah. able, <laughs> yes. yes um so so my question is regarding this uh Keller geometry so i understand that in order to be able to construct the Hilbert space we're going to need for sure the symplectic structure uh, our metric that has to be positive definite and also this complex stru complex structure which i think is uh the the way you can actually decompose your space in a positive and negative eigenspaces but then you also gave three conditions that were required in these complex in these three structures. So my question is, uh, why do you need these three extra conditions? I, I think it's quite uh, strong to have these conditions. So mm -hmm. I my question is, can you relax them? I guess that if you relax them, I am not sure, but I guess that if you relax them, then you may not be working anymore with a Keller vector space, maybe with another kind of vector space. But can can you do it? Has it been done or do you really need these three conditions? Right. So thank you. This is an excellent question. So um, let me see where, so, right. Um, 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 so it was explaining that uh, for a color space, you have these three structures, symplectic, metric, complex, and but they are not independent. For two of them, I mean, they need to have this compatibility condition. The compatibility is that, you know, so uh, omega is always in your phase space because it's already in the classical theory. So to quantize, you introduce, for instance, a J, but not any complex structure is allowed. There is a condition. The condition is that the product of J and omega needs to be 
a positive definite matrix. So, needs, so this is the condition that you put on, 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 on J. Uh, you can also start from, 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 from G, and, and, but it's, it's equivalent. So let me just, for the sake of, of concreteness, focus on the first one. Again, not every complex structure is allowed. Needs to be a complex structure, so squared to be minus identity, and this product needs to be a positive definite matrix. Now you ask me, I mean, um, this seems a strong condition. Why is not enough to have a complex structure? Where what would fail if you uh, uh, if if the product of, of of this product is not a metric? What would fail is that um, this third condition. I told you that if you give me a complex structure, you can decompose the phase space in in positive and negative eigen spaces. And then I told you that it is guaranteed that the symplectic product is positive definite in the positive eigenspace. And then I, I, I use that to build a Hilbert space out of it. That will fail. If the complex structure is not compatible with the metric G, then the symplectic product is not guaranteed to be positive definite, and you cannot build a Hilbert space. If you want to see the details, uh, the proof uh, that I didn't show uh, uh, uses that. In fact, I was the proof starts by by using the positive definiteness of G. If if that fails, then then you cannot build a Hilbert space. Uh, um, uh, so 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 therefore, uh, it's not enough to have a complex structure. You need to have a complex structure, um, uh, which is compatible in this triangle uh, manner with, 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 with a metric. Uh, uh, you know, this extra condition on the complex structure. Any other question? Helena, please, uh, can you unmute yourself? hear me yeah yeah okay um thank you very much for for this lesson it was really um learnful. and i wanted to ask about this complex uh, structure and if it does have any physical meaning or you can give any physical meaning to it as it relates the classical and the quantum parts of the theory mm -hmm. yes and um, um, thank you for 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 the question uh, it allows me to emphasize a bit better one of the main messages I wanted to convey. Um, um, let me see where I have uh, yeah. Right. Um, so um, 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 I mean, first of all, remember that um, um, uh, what what you have is is any of these three, any two of these three structures. Uh, and omega is already in the classical phase space. So that is given to you. So what we add is either a J or a G, whatever you want. From one, you get the other. So it doesn't, I speak about J all the time, but I could phrase everything in terms of G. Uh, uh, they, are, they are related uh, one to one correspondence uh, by, by any of these, of these equations. Uh, 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 so let me answer your question using G. Uh, 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 rather than J. Uh, I insist, it's completely equivalent. Uh, the question, uh, sorry, um, what is that? Um, um, yeah. the, the, the answer to your question is this box, that the physical meaning of this G is that it provides the covariance matrix of the Fock vacuum. So it completely characterizes the properties of the Fock vacuum. The, 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 you know, the Fock vacuum is a quasi-free state, quasi-free Gaussian state. So it's fully determined by the second moments. And this G is precisely that, precisely the second moments. So if you are in quantum mechanics, this G tells you the uncertainties 
in Q and P, and also the correlations between different Qs and different Ps. So it has full information about, about uh, all the uncertainties and correlations. And every single physical question can be extracted from the components of, of the covariance. So therefore, the complex structure or G is a geometric manner to encode all the properties of, 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 the, of the fog vacuum. And whenever there is a symmetry, like time invariant symmetry, then there is a preferred uh, uh, choice. There is a preferred vacuum. And in a standard coordinates, G looks the identity, which is the covariance matrix of the, of the vacuum. But if not, you can choose whatever you want. And you can choose one. I can choose another. Mine can be squeezed with respect to yours. Um, 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 uh, yeah, but, but, um, 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 uh, just needs to be a pure, I didn't mention it, but it was um, uh, implicit. It was a, a pure uh, Gaussian quasi-free uh, state. I don't know if I have answered uh, your question. Uh, I think I did. Um, yeah, I have to think about it, but I think, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Right. So the answer is that it specifies completely what the vacuum is. Because if I ask you, you know, if I ask you, uh, 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 what is your vacuum? Uh, or, uh, then physically, then the way you will tell me is by giving me the covariance matrix. This is the way you report your vacuum. But this is exactly what the complex structure or the metric G is doing for you. Okay, so I have to understand the metrics at, as the usual concept of metrics I have, like uh, it's giving me a concept of distances or maybe I'm mean, misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Right, I call it metric because it's, it's symmetric and positive definite. Okay. Because, uh, but that is not given, here we are not using it as to measure distances. I just call it metric because, because it has the properties of a Euclidean metric, right? Mm -hmm. Symmetric and positive definite. Okay. It's a distance in the vector space. Let's say it again. It's a distance in the vector space right. that you're using. Right. It defines a distance uh, in the vector space. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 you could use it to define a distance, but I, I am not using that 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 that, that distance uh, for anything. Okay, thank you. And uh, maybe uh, is a J is a J is it the dagger uh, and the quantum level? I think I recall from geometric quantization that the J was becoming the dagger. Is it is it true or? Uh, um, um, uh, I mean, the, um, remember that the, the dagger is the notion of a joint, which is yeah. associated to an inner product. Uh, because uh, the notion of a joint, uh, even if we in quantum mechanics, we forget many times it is really defined from the from your inner product. Uh, and J, uh, J selects a subspace, uh, which, uh, uh, so therefore the inner product knows about J. And, and, but, uh, right. Um, the, the colloquial notion of saying what J does, J gives you the notion of positive and negative frequency. <laughs> Although I don't like to use that terminology because that terminology is only I mean, is only true literally frequency in 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 Minkowski space time or wherever you have time time symmetry. Uh, what J is doing is giving you the notion of negative and positive norm subspace out of which you define the vacuum. Uh, uh. Um, are there any other questions? Maybe let me uh, let me ask a question then. Um, so sometimes people emphasize that um, the Hamiltonian needs to be bounded below mm -hmm. uh, for some reason. Uh, is it is it uh, the message of you think that you know, the message un understood is that there is no uh, kind of uh, ground state? So is that statement not really applicable, or is um, it's applicable only for a given observer um, that it's going to be uh, bounded below? Or what's um, what can, can you comment on this on this fact? Yeah. Right. Um, 
uh, the Hamiltonian is assumed to be bounded below because otherwise the theory is not stable. You know, any state will, if there are interactions, of course, which are in nature, will always want to jam to lower energy states and, and you will never, never end if it is not bounded below. But your point is, is a good question is, but then, then there is a, a, a ground state. Uh, the answer is no, because, because bonded below refers to expectation values. Uh, but ground state refers to eigenstate. So uh, uh, the lower bound, the statement is that the, the lower bound is not the eigenvalue of any state. So, 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 okay. so can be bounded below, but there is no ground, ground there is no state, single state, where, uh, uh, that minimizes, that reaches that, that, that lower band. And this is what happens with a time-dependent harmonic oscillator. If you take a time-dependent harmonic oscillator, uh, and I mean, with a time-dependent harmonic oscillator or a bunch of them, it happens something interesting that at a given time, there is always a lower uh, 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 ground state. But after some time, that ground state is not anymore the ground state because the Hamiltonian is changing in time. So for finite dimensional systems, you can always talk about the instantaneous vacuum. Say, you know, you can say, it is true, I don't have a global ground state, but at every single time, if you freeze the time, I know what is the ground state. That is true. In quantum field theory, that is not even available. The, the instantaneous ground state of the Hamiltonian is, uh, generically, not a well-defined quantum quantum state. So, uh, so you cannot even use these instantaneous notions of vacuum. In fact, I think everybody working in quantum field theory in court space times has tried to define a preferred vacuum, even myself. <laughs> and 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 but none of them is 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 really absolute and, and 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 my strong belief is that there is no way to define a prefer we just need to accept it we can only do it in certain circumstances under many conditions in general we need to accept that there is no ground state uh, not even instantaneous ground state of a hamiltonian in general and we just need to live with the fact that in absence of ground states any fog vacua are equally good for, for, for from the physical viewpoint. Okay. All right. Um, last call for any other questions? No. All right. So Ivan uh, will be back right tomorrow. Uh, 